Okay, welcome everyone. And just keeping an eye on participants, but um, I would just like to say um, a sincere welcome to this special World Water Week session on Back to the Future, Integrating Rice and Fish for Building Resilience. This session is organized by World Fish in collaboration with our CGIR partners, the International Water Management Institute, IMI, and the International Rice Research Institute, IRI. Also the CGR Research Programme on Fish Agri-Food Systems, or FISH for short, and partners. So my name is Marc Dubois, and I'm the World Fish um, Lead for Fish in Multifunctional Landscapes. And this is in, in coordination and collaboration with IMI, and I'll be moderating this event. We already have uh, around about 20 people joining us virtually from around the world. So good morning, uh, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you may be joining us from. And while we wait for um, more of you to join us, um, let, me, uh, let me quickly direct your attention to some housekeeping rules that should be showing on your screens right now. So please take a few moments to read through. And let me um, draw your attention particularly to the fact that the event is being split into two main sections. Um, the research presentations, of which we have three, and the breakout room sessions, also, also three. It's important that you're engaging with us through um, the Zoom app um, and not on your browser to be able to engage properly in our breakout session activities today. So this is very important. The Zoom chat box has been disabled, disabled by the organizing committee. So please direct all comments and questions into the pathable chat box. And we advise you to go on split screen for a smoother experience. So you have pathable and Zoom split, so you'd have two, okay? And then finally, please type in your full name, work title and organization name into this pathable chat box. So we have a, an idea of who is attending and, and from where. So just let me check again. Okay, so we're increasing the numbers uh, quite well, quite nicely. Um, given that we have a very limited uh, time for this session, I think without further ado, I would like to invite uh, Dr. Shakuntala Filstead, who is the global lead for nutrition and public health at World Fish, and also rather exciting this year's World Food Prize winner to the virtual floor for her opening remarks. Thank you very much. Um, over to you now, Shakuntala. Thank you, Mark, for your introduction and greetings to everyone from Copenhagen. Rice fish food systems are not new. There is evidence of traditional practices as early as 1500 years ago in regions across China, India, and Southeast Asia. In these systems, fish are either stocked or allowed to enter rice fields from surrounding waters, or both ways, both, a bit of both. And fish is harvested at intervals for household, household consumption, as well as for sale. These mutually beneficial fish and rice systems allow for the production of aquatic foods in water, dependent on crop production systems, rice fields, without compromising rice, rice yields, perhaps even benefiting yields. Rice fish systems have the potential to address food and nutrition security of producers, especially small scale farmers, as well as provide multiple other benefits, such as increasing household income and improving livelihoods. Diversifying participation in the food systems, also for women and youth, and protecting the environment. Studies have shown reduced greenhouse gas emissions from these systems, as well as an enabling for a circular economy. Despite the multiple benefits of rice fish systems, 
the interest, adoption, and implementation of this approach are still limited. And there are challenges, including modification of rice fields, adoption of new rice trains in rice fields using limited water, changes in the use of rice fields and surrounding areas, fragmented supply chains and market systems, and unpredictable weather patterns such as prolonged drought or flooding. With less than nine harvests before we reach 2030, we must reset our perspectives on these traditional systems and create ways to bridge these systems with modern innovations and technologies in order to realize the full potential in addressing food and nutrition security for all. One of the key action areas resulting from the UN Food Systems pre-summit held last month and leading towards the summit later this month is the transformation of aquatic food systems. And this also includes the rice fish systems and transformation of these landscapes. A shift towards diversification is necessary and is presently gaining traction. For example, the diversification of aquatic foods to include prawns, crabs, crayfish, and snails, as seen in Bangladesh, China, and Vietnam. This transformation of food systems is also echoed in the one CGIR's vision and mission to transform food, land, and water systems in the climate crisis. As we develop solutions and actions, action plans to build resilience now and in the future, we must take a holistic food systems approach that is still context specific and culturally appropriate to the rice aquatic food systems that we work with. While we listen to the presentations from the various speakers today, please do bear in mind that we must all be part of the solutions towards realizing food systems that are sustainable, equitable, and can nourish nations within planetary boundaries. Thank you all, and I look forward to a productive and interesting event. Over to you, Mark. Many thanks, Shakundala, for those excellent opening remarks, which I think frame um, the rest of the session brilliantly. Thank you very much. Um, I would like now to move to the presentations led by uh, um, our three presenters, um, experts in their respective fields. And they will discuss um, how um, this integrated system can build resilience against climate impacts and achieve a more sustainable and healthy food system. We have uh, three presenters and their biography is up on the screen now. Um, Alvin Lopez, Sudhir Yadav and Bethany Smith. I invite our first presenter, Alvin Lopez, who is the Senior Natural Resources and Agricultural Specialist at the Asian Development Bank, to the virtual floor to present his take on influencing investments to improve water and land use, to deliver on the SDGs and national development priorities. Alvin, over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mark. Uh, Thank you very much, and thanks, uh, Shakuntala, also for that uh, introductions. Uh, good afternoon, good morning, good evening, all. And uh, I have the slide on screen, yes. So in this uh, session, basically on Back to the Future, uh, I've been Mark Wolfish. Thank you first for the invitation to join this session. Uh, the focus of the presentation is basically that I've been requested is looking at uh, influencing investments to improve water land use, water and land use to deliver on the SDGs. So, and national development priorities. Next slide, please. So the key questions that I will really attempt to answer from an Asian Development Bank perspective is uh, basically sharing with you what is the approach that ADB is taking in supporting the SDGs, very general. And what is the impact of COVID-9 on food security inevitable at this point of time, nutrition and food systems resilience? 
third thing, third question that I would also attempt to address is to what extent has ADB so far incorporated rights fish system priorities? Uh, and fourthly, ADB investments uh, really in water resources and agriculture with a particular focus on Cambodia where, where I'm based. And what is really required for upscaling some of these investments to answer the, the question uh, posed by Bullfish to us. So next slide, please. So in a quick, quick sort of a snapshot, not spending too much time, uh, ADB's overall approach in supporting the SDGs and achieving the SDGs is, take, takes this multi-pronged approach on aligning its strategies and operations with the SDGs. Uh, we have seven operational priority areas uh, to address and support all the 17 SDGs. Uh, ADB directs finance to projects uh, that help development the DMCs are developing member countries achieve the SDGs. We also mobilize finance for including the private sector and support knowledge, capacity building, and also most importantly, especially in regard with reference to this forum, uh, works in partnership with various different multilateral development banks and development partners uh, like yourselves, the host of this forum, and looks for more opportunities. So. Our aim is basically at the end of the session, we hope that more partnership can be established for specific uh, activities to move forward. Next slide, please. And a quick snapshot in terms of the impact of uh, COVID-19 on food security. I mean, if you can look on that, uh, this is a recent uh, sort of statistics from the World Food Program uh, over here. We can see the severe impact also of COVID-19 on food security and nutrition in, in general. And five bullet points over there. Uh, firstly, how it's threatening to achieve the SDGs, especially goal number two. Second point on the importance of sort of uh, importance of managing landscapes and the growth of agriculture and livestock sectors as well. Suddenly, has uh, really increased the risk of environmental degradation, climate change, and increase uh, stresses on the environment. And also, most importantly, zoonotic spillovers. And uh, Third bullet point over there is also an opportunity. I mean, the recovery from COVID-19 pandemic presents an opportunity, an opportunity for, in this regard, also scaling up the rice fish systems and uh, taking a more integrated food system approach also requires a lot more investment in natural capital, public health, etc. Next slide, please. Uh, so inland fisheries and rice fish systems in ADB's irrigation investments. ADB puts in a lot of, uh, from my perspective, coming from the water resources and also agriculture sector, a lot of investment in irrigation, water resources management. And fish are a major contributor in terms of livestock, food security, nutrition value. However, that first bullet point over there, is the economic and nutritional contribution of fisheries and, and in rice systems are often not captured really uh, in, during the economic analysis of uh, irrigation investments and sort of modernization initiatives. Uh, is it sufficiently being captured? We will ask ourselves again. Uh, second point on irrigation systems using diversions also disrupt the natural flow. Uh, migration routes of fisheries and fish within the rice systems as well. And uh, a publication, as you can see over there, a 2020 publication on screen, ADB acknowledges uh, that incorporating fisheries and integrating fishways into irrigation investments can really strengthen the resilience of aquatic life and also impacts the climate change by maintaining these natural ecosystems. So in, to, in order to target uh, some of these uh, investments, uh, which are being increasingly focused, uh, included in our investments are targeting a range of SDGs over there and of course SDG number six as well uh, on water and really cross-cutting that issue and also addressing ADB's uh, strategy 2030 operational priorities that I list down there three operational priorities uh, which are particularly relevant in terms of uh, focusing on rice fish uh, systems. Next slide please. So this is just an example of an ongoing investment in Laos as well, and just a, a snapshot of a grant supporting sort of uh, construction of uh, 
of uh, fisheries as well. And there was a separate session earlier this week on the, uh, basically fish parcels and uh, fish friendly irrigation as well, which enables uh, also increased uh, fisheries within the rice systems. Next slide, please. Uh, overall, a snapshot, as you can see, ADB's investment priorities over there in the, within the uh, Cambodia, as an example, as a range of opportunities and uh, a range of opportunities in our large investment projects. And the question is, have we also uh, been able to maximize opportunity to integrate uh, components of uh, rice fish uh, considerations and systems within all these different investment projects which are focused primarily on irrigation and also agriculture. And to answer that question, I think there has been a lot of missed, missed opportunities as well. So moving forward, we really look forward to possibly nailing down opportunities. Next slide, please. Next slide. Yeah, we can just quickly go through this in consideration of time. It's just a snapshot and overview of the projects I mentioned and how they are distributed all around Cambodia. In particular, you can see this around the Tony Sap as well. So this is my final slide. I'd like to spend a bit more time on this, at least the next four minutes I have in consideration of time. So what is really required for upscaling investments in better water land use and especially for rice fish systems? I mean, we've already heard about the benefits of integrating fisheries into irrigation. No need to uh, talk more about that. But so one of the key point number one over there is the enabling conditions and policy environment. Are these already in place, especially those guiding irrigation development? Is there a need for reform to consider why the ecological process and water allocation guidelines? Are, does, does the EIA uh, sufficiently capture, capture the impact on fisheries and fish migration cycles also? will be important to ensure broader overarching policies of the environment are also favorable. Second point on intersectoral coordination, I think from a sovereign operations perspective, this is where we're coming from, are all the sectors on board. I mean, relevant ministries and departments responsible for fisheries, water resources management, agriculture and environment. I mean, we talk about mainstreaming fisheries into irrigation and rice, but uh, what, what is the fate of agriculture to start with? In some places in reality, there even sometimes a real disconnect between irrigation and agricultural production. And uh, how do you actually address this uh, disconnect between intersectoral coordination, which is really critical. Third bullet point over there, nothing beats the value of a successful pilot. And we look forward to really working with partners like Worldfish and others to pilot schemes at uh, reasonable various scales to demonstrate some of these benefits. Wolfish is already working on many demo projects and including, I think the USAID project, uh, which has been piloted in Cambodia on the uh, rice fish systems. Fourth bullet point there, the role of multilateral and bilateral development agencies and a coherent approach. Is there a coordinated and coherent approach and policy from multilateral and bilateral agencies when it comes to mainstreaming fisheries into irrigation systems and uh, rice? Uh, only this is only quite new for ADB as well. I mean, uh, we all need to be speaking the same language and sending the same message. Uh, much investments in water resources management development and the entire hydrological systems are often connected. I mean, the Tondi Sap in Cambodia, important for rice and critically important for fisheries, especially the floodplains. So it really makes no sense where one agency or one partner is promoting fisheries and rice fish systems and another is supporting investments that restrict movements uh, and productivity of fish and fisheries. So it's very, this coordination is extremely critical. Capacity, is there sufficient, next bullet point there, sufficient capacity within the country to support the development of such initiatives uh, from the initial conceptualization and uh, feasibility assessments? If not, do we have a sufficient international network to tap upon and to build national capacity? We definitely need to gain more traction on this and include capacity building and training components. It's completely operating at different scales. And are we really there yet in order to address the way the systems are developing? Retrofitting versus new development. Uh, what is the low hanging fruit? 
can we work together and identify priority water resources infrastructure schemes in need of retrofitting which really brings me to my next point in terms of prioritization within the broader landscape when resources resources are really scarce uh, prioritization is key uh, i think in cambodia again the tallest have floodplains it's a really much larger part of the mekong river system so i mean home to one of the most productive fisheries and aquatic biodiversity globally so what are we looking at what exactly is the impact of the irrigation investments really we all know the answer to that and how can we do it better how can we work together with partners and uh, is there sufficient guidance and world fish produce a guide recently is that being operationalized effectively can we work together on operationalizing that next point on getting into the game early really uh, irrigation investments do not suddenly happen i mean they're often already on a longer term plan at national level also within the published agreed pipeline of key donors you have irrigation investments plan can we partner at the early stage further upstream so that we can influence concept and design how do we strengthen next point environmental due diligence i mean have a look at the eias and environmental management plans for major investment do they sufficiently capture also uh, fisheries if not why next important point i'm finishing my slide here and one minute over time is there a clear demonstration of the economics associated with the investment I mean, what is the economic viability? Have we actually demonstrated that? Can we use that to leverage more these sort of investment? And my final bullet point over there is thinking beyond national boundaries. I mean, often systems and especially productivity of fisheries in areas like Tonlesap, Cambodia, is really, really dependent on broader water resources management priorities. And uh, that critical importance of regional cooperation and why, what are the challenges? Uh, if we work together, there's a lot of opportunity to address that in order to integrate uh, sort of uh, priorities for rice, rice fish system more effectively. On that point, uh, I have, that's about it. The final slide, uh, please. Uh. Many thanks, Alvin. That Thank was, you very much. Yeah. That was excellent, Alvin. Thank you. Um, May I now invite the next presenter, Sudhir Yadav, who is the research lead for the Soil, Water and Environment Unit at IRI. Over to you, Sudhir. Thank you very much, Mark. Thank you, uh, Sakuntla and, and Alvin also. Um, let me, let me, uh, First, thanks, Elvin, to put a very good perspective from, from ADB uh, side, but that's not the case with all development partners, and he highlighted that as part of his concluding slide, that they see uh, kind of this uh, role of uh, integrated approach uh, when we talk about the, the landscape management. And I would like to start with uh, uh, this um, statement from, from WHO that uh, which is quite concerning that around uh, one in 10 children uh, are born with low birth weight and uh, that is causing about 45 percent of the death among the children under five in South Asia and that's not only in South Asia if you look at uh, information in Myanmar in Cambodia Elvin was talking about Cambodia it's up to 40 percent which is really really very concerning and um, uh, if you look from a global perspective, not only Asia, that one in the nine people, you know, is, is hungry or undernourished, uh, which, uh, which is adding to a challenge to all of us that how do we not only address food security, but how do we make sure that the, the food which we are growing is nutritious. If that the those challenges were not sufficient, then now we are what we are. Uh, the, the the news is coming that the climate change will not only affect uh, the uh, the food uh, security, but it will also kind of lead to greater um, malnutrition, especially in the in the in the in the children. And uh, the high temperature is one of the major factor which is contributing to our this. Um, there are. Uh, Information, there is a data that in next, by 2050, the, the temperature can, can go uh, from one to three degree high. I mean, um, let's hope we can control that one. But if that would happen, we would have a significant challenge that how, how do we make sure that we, uh, we grow sufficient food, but more importantly, nutritious food. 
So uh, today I'm gonna put a pitch uh, forward in terms of rice fish system that how it is important uh, in terms of building resilience uh, uh, to, to the food system. And this is a, um, a joint work of, um, of World Peace, Yumi and Iri, which we are doing in, in Asia. If you look from a, from a nature perspective, this is a topography map of South and Southeast Asia. And nature, nature gave us an answer that uh, if you look at the three mega delta, those are uh, low-lying area, give us excellent opportunity to look at uh, rice fish system and add nutrition dimension uh, to, the, to the food system. Again, rice, uh, which feed to you know, 4 billion uh, people in the world. So that landscape provide us natural opportunity in terms of uh, coupling with the, with the fishery and other aquatic system. So when we talk about rice fish system, it's not kind of just one, one size fit all. There are various kind of rice fish system. Um, we, we know uh, kind of a, uh, the, 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 the normal approach is either, uh, you know, you go with aquaculture only, or you go with the monoculture of rice. But here we are talking about how these two uh, go together. Uh, so the one of one of, one of the common approaches uh, growing rice and fish in alternate season, wet season, let's say rice or wet season fish, and then rice season rice or vice versa, depending on the conditions. But then there is also uh, in many countries that both rice fish go together. What you can see in the picture, and these two systems are quite common in in um, uh, in in Bangladesh, in Myanmar, in in, in Cambodia, which is. Uh, and, and, and uh, uh, farmers are now uh, doing it. There are also now moving towards, in terms of achieving scale, a, a lot of focus on community-based fisheries uh, and, uh, and then rice field uh, fisheries. The, the difference uh, uh, of five and six is basically, the five is that where, uh, the six is where the, the, the fish from the natural kind of uh, uh, water bodies, river or, or so, flow in. So you you are not um, uh, releasing the fish finger links. It's coming in, uh, you know, to the to the water bodies. While in pipe, you uh, you you hear the, those finger links. And this is a kind of an uh, an uh, area which is um, very much now in in demand because this take care of some of the challenges which Alvin talked that. Um, how we look from a landscape perspective. So if I'll also cite an example from, from Cambodia that uh, in terms of uh, further improving the, uh, the rice fisheries, uh, rice field fisheries, uh, there's a lot of work which World Fish is doing now on, on the CFR system, which is community fish refuse system. So basically this approach is uh, how do we co-manage water bodies in, the, in, a, in a given village or in a, you know, in a community. And how we use not only for um, uh, you know, other use of water, but also as a seasonal refuge for the fisheries so that uh, fisheries can survive for extended dry period. So uh, to, to kind of adapt and mitigate the climate change, uh, now researchers are kind of putting forward approaches which which can address some of these challenges. The other perspective which I, I would like to share that uh, uh, although we have a lot of interest in terms of uh, sustainable intensification and, and, and resilient integrated agroecological based farming system, uh, especially when it comes to kind of medium to upland area, there are various choices whether you you in the dry season you go with vegetables whether you go with uh, you know pulses you go with uh, with maize uh, or or other uh, you know uh, other things uh, fodders but there's a large area which is in lowland and in that one still farmer are growing traditional uh, varieties and because of coastal area sometime in the dry season because of salinity they cannot even grow anything in that one of the big opportunities is that you, you bring fishery and you increase uh, the overall productivity of the system. And again, it's not about how much you are producing, but it's a nutritious food that you provide. Uh, otherwise, there is not many options currently in, in those regions. So again, this uh, 
a system help us to reach out to that extreme poverty zone where there are not many choices and and uh, give a solution to us uh, so rice fishery not only in terms of uh, you know helping out in food security and, and, and nutrition the, the other major area is environmental pollution um, so this is the um, the information on nitrogen input so if you look at that around 25% synthetic fertilizer nitrogen is added through synthetic fertilizer and we all know that what are the you know significant challenges that is that that has been posed you know uh, because of nitrogen to the system uh, and again rice fish uh, give us the, that opportunity to, to reduce this um, this proportion of nitrogen to the to the system and i will i will give you some example the other uh, very concerning part is that about two third of agricultural land globally are at the risk of pesticide pollution and uh, there is no direct way but if as a community you go with the rice fish system there is a Obviously, there is a, there's a behavior change, there's a tendency that they will be, uh, farmer are more listening in terms of reducing the pesticides. I was saying about the nitrogen, this is one example uh, where uh, we, are, we are working uh, together, you know, World Peace, Mary is working together with ACIR um, and uh, looking at uh, community level solution, um, not only for, for rice fish, but also looking at the environment pollution. And there we look at like, if you go with the best management practices of nitrogen, uh, you get rice yield 5.8. Uh, uh, even when you don't uh, kind of devote any area for uh, fish refuse. If you devote the area for fish refuse, obviously your uh, per hectare yield is low because again, that area has been uh, shared with fish, but then you get additional uh, you know, uh, productivity of fish. And if you look from profit perspective, uh, there is like 41 to 50 percent increase in the in the yield. And if you look from this one from a conventional practice perspective, this yield could be as high as 132 percent. So again, this is very very important, especially to other development partner uh, to to indicate this message to highlight that these these systems uh, not only nutritious but can be very profitable. Uh, from environment perspective, this is a very uh, interesting information that we have gathered that not only again from productivity, productivity perspective that uh, it also helps to improve the uh, predators. Uh, so uh, the, the reduction in pesticide is not any magic, it, it changed the, the, the ecosystem. Um, but however, there is uh, also information that the change is um, fluctuating between dry and wet season and more work is required on that side. On dry season, there's a significant increase in predators than the pest species. The another interesting thing is what I, I was saying in the beginning that this open new ways of addressing, uh, you know, the climate change uh, issues. Uh, so what happened that often uh, there is a water scarcity in the dry season and there's a conflict between fish farmer and, and rice farmer. And so uh, the, the rice field, rice paddy field, provide opportunity to raise the seedlings, uh, oh, sorry, fingerlings, and, uh, or, uh, and those fingerlings, 60 to 90 days, then can go to the fish pond. Uh, otherwise, there's a conflict now, these, the, the community is working together. And this is, a, again, a new model uh, where, uh, you know, there's a conflict in trust, and now you are bringing the community together to, to find a solution. So you don't look at compromising that you are going on long duration rice variety. You go with whatever uh, short duration high yielding variety you want to go. You use the area for growing the fingerlings and then fingerlings can be transferred to the ponds and you get best yield of rice, you get best yield of fish. Everything is not good that we know that. Uh, and we had to also uh, you know, uh, recognize the challenges, especially the, what I was saying that we are moving towards landscape level options. So when we look at the community-based model, uh, there are um, information about instability of the system. And it's not because of the core part of the science, because as soon as you talk about community model, you are dealing with social domain. So we need to look research from that perspective also that how, how can we uh, address the social uh, you know, challenges also. So this is four-year data from Bangladesh where 
uh, there was the instability of the of the performance same challenge goes to the when we go with the suitability assessment but the point which i want to highlight that now the technologies are so strong that we can really go in depth this is one example of uh, using the suitability from two uh, you know perspective one conventional approach of uh, coarse resolution images which highlight everything is more or less same uh, gradient while when you go high resolution images which are available for large area you see that the, there is a large variation within within the selected proxy so if we use the modern technologies we can develop plot level solution so this is apply for both landscape as well as you zoom to a plot level so that's where the technology now have developed significantly and give us solution uh, to look at the macro to micro level Sorry to interrupt. You have uh, two minutes left. Thanks, Sudhir. Last slide. Thanks, Mark. Um, so, uh, uh, Alvin presented the challenges from a perspective of uh, you know uh, investment and 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 scaling. These are more on biophysical social side. That uh, some of the challenges are still there's a high initial investment cost uh, that inhibit a uh, kind of adoptions. Land suitability. I talk about it that there is a more opportunity for us to to look at it and uh, develop more details. Map uh, land and water governance has been a major challenge, and that conflict in trust Alvin already spoke. So perhaps uh, I can leave it there. Uh, it's not about technology; it's also about how we help the community to make the decisions. And last, perhaps uh, again, we need to look beyond production post harvest. Storage and value chain of fisheries are equally and perhaps more important. Thank you very much. Thanks, Mark. Much appreciated, Sudhir, and, and, and sorry to rush you. They're very, very tight schedules, um, but uh, excellent presentation. If I could uh, move now to uh, Bethany Smith, um, please, uh, who will be presenting a video demonstration on scaling rice fish systems, decision support tools for tailoring and targeting investments. Bethany um, is a research consultant at World Fish and also a PhD candidate at James Cook University. May I invite you to the virtual floor? Thank you. Thank you for the introduction, Mark. And thank you also to Sudhir, Alvin and Shakuntala for your insights. Good afternoon from Australia. And as said today, I'm going to be premiering a video demo, which provides an insight into World Fish's work on rice fish systems within Myanmar's Iowadi Delta. It also demonstrates a decision support tool, which is presently in production, which is going to help us target priority areas for investment in food system transformations. So without further ado, I will put the video on for you. Rice and fish are some of the most important global food resources, contributing to the health and nutrition of billions whilst providing the backbone of many national and local economies. To ensure food can be produced with sufficient quantity and quality to meet the demands of a growing population, a transformation in food production systems is required. Integrated agroecological practices offer a key opportunity for such transformation, utilising natural processes to develop food systems with improved water and land use that can provide resilient, nutritious and dietary diverse food resources whilst enhancing local livelihoods and minimising the environmental impact of food production. Rice fish systems are a key example of an agroecological practice, where rice is cultivated in the same plot of land as naturally occurring or introduced fish populations, which are present either simultaneously or on rotation throughout the year. Rice fish systems provide farmers with a number of key benefits in comparison to monocropping. These include increased resource efficiency, higher net income, greater nutritional benefits and a reduction in negative environmental impacts due to a reduced requirement for fertilizer input. However, in many areas, there are practical constraints in implementation, including initial investment costs, the requirement for year-round water availability, access to infrastructure and the presence of an enabling policy landscape which supports land use change. So how do we evaluate if, when and where rice fish systems should be implemented? Suitability mapping is a technique that has been developed to provide insight into the agroecological suitability of land, enabling priority areas to be identified that are best suited to 
and will most benefit from the implementation of a particular type of system. During the mapping process, geographical information systems are commonly used to synthesize large volumes of biophysical and socioeconomic data, enabling results to be displayed in a visual and readily interpretable format. Building on earlier work by IMI and IRI, WorldFish have developed a geospatial tool to model suitability for integrated, culture-based rice fish systems within Myanmar's Irrawaddy Delta. The region is nationally recognised for its importance in terms of rice and fish production. However, high levels of poverty and malnutrition remain within rural communities. A conversion from monoculture to integrated rice fish systems may provide a key opportunity to tackle this. However, national policy is resistant to such a transformation. The production of regional level suitability maps alongside rice fish trial plots has revealed a land area of 15,716 km squared is suited to rice fish, with predicted benefits from 10% implementation, including a net income of over 268 million US dollars and an additional 1 times 10 to the 5 milligrams of edible fish portions within the region. To date, these results have supported a favourable shift in agricultural policy towards integrated production practices. However, further work is required to identify where rice fish systems should be implemented to best benefit rural communities at the local scale. This has been facilitated through the development of a decision support tool and accompanying user guides which enable rice fish suitability to be determined using a participatory modelling and scenario-based planning process. The tool has been developed with three key priorities in mind. Usability, accessibility and applicability. The tool uses open source software with clear and interpretable graphics that ensure results can be readily applied in the real world. Most importantly, the tool enables stakeholders to select from a menu of options by weighting the criteria that contribute to suitability based on local needs. This is particularly important in relation to socioeconomic factors, enabling stakeholders to prioritise or place equal importance upon the goals of improved nutrition, income or employment. To understand how the decision support tool works, let's introduce you to our group of stakeholders. Here we have members from local government departments, small-scale farmers and fishers, and NGOs, who have come together to help determine priority areas for investment in the region. These stakeholders have a number of different priorities. The decision support tool provides a forum for participatory discussions that can account for each stakeholder's requirements in determining rice fish suitability. The first step requires stakeholders to develop an understanding of the criteria used in the model. This can be broken down into four categories. Hazards that may impact the system, including temperature increase, storms and flooding. System development, including available land area, access to infrastructure and the value chain. Biophysical characteristics, including elevation, soil and salinity levels and irrigated land area. And socioeconomic factors, such as population demography, malnutrition, employment and poverty levels. The criteria were selected during participatory workshops comprising a variety of local and national stakeholders. The decision support tool enables you to explore each criterion in greater depth, describing how and why each contributes to suitability and providing an insight into the data that will be used in the model. Once you've explored this criteria, you can move on to step two. This is where stakeholder input is required, as we ask you to weight each criterion based on how important you perceive it to be in relation to suitability in your area, given local needs and aspirations. This step uses the analytic hierarchy process to calculate how each criteria interacts to contribute to overall suitability. All you have to do is decide which criteria is most important and by how much. Let's look at the value chain as an example. What do you believe is more important for suitability? The number of fish markets or the number of fertilizer and pesticide sellers? In that case, we give priority to that criterion. And how much more important are fish markets on a scale from one to nine? Okay, and there we have our answer. Now you have to repeat this step for each criterion within each component of the model until we obtain a final list of weightings for rice fish suitability. The decision support tool does the rest for you. You can move through the next stages to view the underlying calculations that make up the model, but in essence, 
the tool will use a process of multi-criteria evaluation to calculate suitability for each township within the region based on your weighting results. The results can be visualised within QGIS, clearly demonstrating how suitability varies and, if you want to delve deeper, why. As a result, decisions on where it's best to tailor and target investments to support a transition from monoculture to integrated farming can be made. This preliminary version of the decision support tool is in further development, with results from an economic viability analysis for the region to be incorporated in coming months. As a first step, this will enable a quantitative value to be attached to suitable land area, providing stakeholders with a clear cost-benefit analysis in relation to local income following a transformation in land use. Additionally, the tool is capable of supporting suitability analysis at a much broader scale for a variety of different production practices and commodities. Within the short term, this aims to be scaled out to other geographies and commodities within Myanmar and scaled up to a regional analysis of rice fish culture suitability, providing insight into the key opportunities and challenges for system implementation across the region. This will support a positive transition in food system transformation, with the decision support tool facilitating a focus on enhancing water and land use to provide regional populations with resilient, nutritious and sustainable food resources into the future. Thank you all for your attention throughout that video and now I'll pass back the virtual floor to Mark Dubois for the breakout sessions. Yes, thank you very much, Bethany. What a lot of work that went into that video. Great, thank you. Um, now, I would just like to draw your attention to the um, opportunity to ask and answer questions in the Pathable chat. We were going to have a um, short question and answer session now before moving into the breakout session, but we've overrun a little bit. Um, and I can see also some of the presenters are answering some of the questions already in the Pathable chat. So I'd, I'd appreciate if you'd continue with that model and we'll move straight into the um, breakout sessions now for the next 25 minutes or so, which will be around three key themes, three breakout sessions, one theme around food system transformations, a second around evidence-based planning and decision support, and a third around what constitutes an enabling environment. Um, there will be uh, facilitators and specialists in each of the three groups, along with the three uh, presenters. Um, our facilitators are Sarah Freed, who is a scientist at um, World Fish under the Resilient Small Scale Fisheries Program. And breakout session two will be facilitated by Sanjiv De Silva, who's a senior regional researcher um, for natural resources governance at the International Water Management Institute. And Dr. Rika Floor, um, innovation system scientist at the International Rice Research Institute. So without further ado, our communication teams will open the rooms and in a few short moments, you will be um, automatically and randomly uh, transported. So this is your telephone box moment into a um, session. So we have roughly the same amount of people in each session and we'll convene back here to discuss the takeaways from each session, as I say, in around 25 minutes. Many thanks. to find our way back. Great. Welcome back. Um, we hope you had fun uh, engaging and an engaging time in participating in these breakout sessions. We are um, now going to move straight into inviting the session leads to um, give us the takeaway messages from their breakout rooms. Before I do, I would just like to ask you if you could type into the chat your name and which breakout group you were in, please. That would that would help us a lot. So um, if while you're doing that, I could now hand the floor to Sarah for breakout session one. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Yes, our breakout room discussed 
the food system transformation and how rice fish systems might be involved in that. So one of the main points we discussed were the challenges around having rice fish involved in the food system transformation. Um, there's quite a few things that we recognized. One is that the interest of investors is still not, uh, not necessarily focused on integrated production. And along with that, there can be a scale mismatch. Often that integrated production is on small scale. And so then it's hard for large scale investments to happen. There was a, also a suggestion for a related opportunity, which is um, bringing in technology to connect producers to markets and also to aggregate production um, to make that investment more likely. There's, a, a, again, challenge with that too, looking at traceability of production, especially with aquaculture. We know that's a challenge, fisheries as well. Um, and then also getting product to market is a challenge. We also had the recognition, the fact that we talk about fish, we don't always talk about aquatic plants or other types of aquatic foods. So just recognizing what kind of products to integrate is another one. And we had a very brief discussion on our second aspect about uh, uh, food system trajectories. And we, one of the important points was looking at how climate change is really determining a lot of trajectories, how we might want to focus rice fish production in the areas that are receiving more water and flooding, and also look at how we can bring all water users together to discuss multifunctional use in the landscape. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much. Sounds like a sounds like an interesting discussion. Um, often in these things, we, you, we just want more time, don't we? Um, so apologies that there was only that amount. But um, I'd like now to uh, move to Sanjeev De Silva to give us the key highlights for um, breakout session two. Thank you. Sanjeev, are you with us? Thank you, Mark. Sorry, I was unmuted. Yeah, so we had a pretty decent uh, discussion. <clears throat> I think we, the, the discussion really started by recognizing the fact that COVID has um, you know, provided another opportunity uh, to bring the, the importance of, of food security and nutrition to the forefront of, of the policy, policy arena. Um, Recognizing that there are, you know, clear challenges in terms of getting the DSD uh, out of, for example, the CG system and into use into by by others, so the the adopters. So you know that could be government, that could be donors, um, supported by investments in university curricula, um, but also mechanisms to actually bring that to different <clears throat> users and adopters at different scales, including communities. And so part of the discussion was also about how we actually do that um, by actually making sure that we have those sort of multiple engagements um, you know, across these different users. Another important point was the, the well, two, two other points. One was the importance of potentially government subsidies. Because the point is that even were you to 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 do a, a pilot, for example, to to convince uh, decision makers, it, it it might be that the first couple of years that that you know the results might be negative, because systems have to mature. People need to understand how to use the systems, and 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 people will need to adopt. The other point was to ensure that you have uh, a long term M and E structure and investment behind those pilots. Not because because systems also evolve. Um, it's not just the short term results, but actually, you know, how do those systems mature over time? Um, it'll be important to actually capture those, um, not just in terms of the 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 output, but I think also the the social structures. Um, those those evolve as well. Um, I would like, yeah. So I'll stop there and, and make room for. 
the, the others to present. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sanjiv. That was that was interesting. Um, lots lots of things that I'd like to come back to on that. But let's let's move to um, Rika Floor to um, please uh, present the highlights from breakout session three. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. Under enabling environment, the discussion um, first uh, a topic that we had was on policies and investments that could enable integration. And one of the related topics there was this multi-ministerial and intersectoral alignment or kind of looking at trade-offs of their priorities. Um, that also needs to be understood so that um, we, th these uh, different priorities can be taken on board or the different sectors, the different uh, ministries could work together and engage better. A second point uh, that was also highlighted was nutrition proposition and how uh, brought how this is brought to the forefront and, and being prioritized. Um, increasingly, um, it's not only food security, but we need to look at nutritional security as well. A third point uh, that was uh, important for the group was uh, public-private engagement, um, looking at the roles that the private sector could do um, and also the public sector and how they work, they could work, what, what role they could play towards scaling and um, particularly involving the different value chains. And um, then we went uh, quite briefly into the second uh, point, which was on the knowledge gaps um, that could support the integration. And uh, a point that was raised on this is taking stock or accounting the economic uh, benefits around the different, say, pillars of, of um, rice fish um, systems, uh, looking at health uh, indicators, looking at nutrition, environment, and many other pillars. And this is uh, important. So I stop with that. Over to you, Mark. Brilliant. Many thanks, Rika. Um, in the interest of time and wanting to give um, Rachel um, McDonald an opportunity to close our session uh, properly. I would just quickly like to thank all of the participants to this session, myself and to the presenters and to the session facilitators. You've all done an excellent job. Thank you very much. Um, so let me just quickly introduce Rachel McDonald, who is the Deputy Director General of Research for Development at the International Water Management Institute. And please, Rachel, welcome for your closing remarks and thank you very much. Thank you, Mark. And, and I really need to start by commending the organizers and speakers for putting together here at World Water Week such a fascinating subject. I've never seen this subject talked about here before, but bringing together these many, many different dimensions, I think it's, it's, it, you, you've raised not only awareness and uh, support for this, but you've shown the complexity of it um, and bringing investment and enabling environment alongside technology is really important. Here at uh, uh, Stock and Water Week, but also from the recent UN Food Systems Pre-Summit, there has been a clarion call for an urgent need for transformation of food, land and water systems. We are seeing this, that the, the, the viral um, videos that came from that food systems summit, it just said, we have a food system, it needs urgent change. And I think what we've seen here are some of the starting blocks for developing that urgent change. We saw the IPCC report that came out just over 10 days ago now. And my goodness, isn't that, that quite frightening? Um, and the need to address what those future conditions are going to be uh, to be able to enable both food and water security means that we have to have more of this joined up thinking of, of coming together, looking at where those droughts and floods and those changes in the water cycle are going to be, but then exploring what those implications are for feeding the world's poor, providing livelihoods, providing the nutrition. I think we've had clear on, uh, um, uh, insight from what is needed to go uh, forward. There is a real call from our various discussions about the need to scale up the current working systems from the current locations that we have. Um, what does that mean? Uh, we've just heard from the summing up from the breakout rooms, but also from our speakers beforehand, 
uh, some ideas on what that could do. Um, a, a theme that has gone through many of the speakers and many of the sessions here at World Water Week is the need to break down traditional silos. Here in water, we have water and sanitation, water for agriculture, water systems. We have many different silos, and that's just within the water community. What this session has also brought into the, the considerations are other areas, the, the food systems, the environmental systems, and how we can then think beyond our traditional areas of academic expertise and embrace that coming together and what is needed to, because we do need to break down those silos if we are going to bring those benefits for health and um, uh, for the many different um, aspects that have been so well articulated in the discussions. We've spoken about the need to bring together policymakers from different ministries, um, our friends within the CGIR uh, centres, as well as a uh, and here at EMI, we work with different ministries. We work with the ministries of water. We work with the ministries of maybe water and irrigation, energy and water. And then there are those that work with the ministries of agriculture. Those are our first points of contact as we're developing ideas. But we know their policies are often completely counterintuitive. One is um, increasing food production. One is saving water. So how do we bring together policymakers and develop policies uh, with those different ministries, and that was one of the, the sort of the key findings in one of the breakout uh, rooms just now is how do we articulate new ways of thinking that allows developments and trade-offs so that we can hit numerous of targets, and we need to be able to do that to look at and into um, investments, um, to put forward those frameworks in which those um, we can encourage new finance coming to the systems. We know that that needs institutional support and we can see that within the teams that are involved here there, there is great knowledge to bring that into institutional support. Investment is critical. We heard from the ADB about their plans for investment but we also know that maybe there are opportunities through sustainable finance through impact investment because many of the benefits that have been shown from existing case studies allow those targets, those ESG targets, those environment, society and governance targets to be hit. So as we're putting together our case studies, building business models around that is going to be important. I love the fact that most of the, um, um, many of the sessions, the feedback sessions, but also what, was the, what came from the speakers was the need to shout loudly about successful case studies and what were the conditions that led to that success. And that is important through webinars like this, but also through publications, through um, blogging, and there's many different ways of, of, of engaging people without, outside the research community to see what are the benefits that could come from this. And of course, that then also then feeds through to capacity support, because we need to take those capabilities, those learning experiences out to a much bigger audience. And Shakuntala was talking about gender, youth and women, and um, uh, those communities that we really knew to be mapped. The video on good suitability mapping was, was wonderful, and it was great to see how the, you know, harnessing that data revolution can make sure that we can help targeting those investments and targeting maybe that private sector part, uh, participation, that input that was being spoken about here. This is a great stepping, um, one of the stepping stones that is needed to encourage that investment. Uh, the ATB also mentioned about working closely in developing with multilateral and bilateral development agencies. We can see this is a really fascinating system that I'm sure will help them meet many of their targets. So we engaging them. It was great to see some donors on this call, but then taking that out further um, as well. One interesting comment that was made early on in, in the speakers was about land and water governance. We know this is a sticking point. This comes out in many of the sessions here at Stop and Water Week. Water rights, land rights, um, uh, and often the lack of them and that lack of those rights to um, support uh, uh, accessing credit, to, uh, to support um, sustainable management of these important resources. So we can see that reforms need to come through with that, maybe through those um, convincing, through those cases, we can show the benefits of, of bringing in the thinking around land, water, governance. And it, it highlights also that it's not just about technology, it's about a strong community approach uh, to these resource systems. 
and I think it, going forward, it, it's something Sarah just mentioned, we really do need for the from the research community, we need numbers on what are not only the nutritional health benefits, but what are the environmental benefits, how much greenhouse gases have been saved, how much biodiversity have we been able to help alongside those dollar returns to help bring in those new investments. And I think what we've seen in the system is this important food, land and water integrated system thinking that is part of our mandate as the CGIR, but it goes beyond that. We're seeing um, systems transformation, systems thinking coming from so many of the global forums and conversations going on now. And I think this food rice system, the fish rice systems uh, exemplifies what can be going forward. So those are my closing remarks, Mark, and back to you. Fabulous. That, that was a... That was a splendid wrap up, Rachel. Thank you so much. You covered a huge amount of ground there. Um, really, really capably and interesting comments from you. And, and thank you for doing that. We have now reached time. And I should just like to say um, to everyone, once again, thank you all for your participation and have a great rest of day. Many thanks. Thank you, Mark. <laughs>